It is Tuesday afternoon, August 29th, 2023. I'm NBC 15 Chief Meteorologist Alan Seals. That is Idalia. That is Franklin. Both of them hurricanes, but Idalia, that's the one that is going to have tremendous impact on the state of Florida. Late afternoon readings, maximum wind 100 miles per hour, gusting to 120. Fortunately, to this point, those maximum winds are confined to close to the center of the storm, but still Florida is beginning to see impact. And you look at that forward motion north at 16 miles an hour. This is moving very rapidly. It is going to make landfall around the Florida Big Bend. Now it's crossing a part of the Gulf of Mexico where typically the water is warm and beneath the surface it would be cold, but this summer We've had a heat wave, not just on land, but there's also something called a marine heat wave. And in a marine heat wave, the surface of the ocean gets hot, the subsurface gets warm, and that's a deeper column of warm water, which serves as fuel for tropical storms and hurricanes. So at this point, we know Idalia is going to continue moving over a part of the Gulf where the water gets even warmer overnight. Well, the water is warmer, but it will move over warmer water overnight. Typically, as a storm moves close to the northern Gulf, dry air comes in and that helps to weaken it. But now the balance is, will you get enough dry air to weaken or will the warm water help it to strengthen? All computer projections, though, very consistent in the last several days on where the center of the storm is likely to go. And you look at these multiple models and many people say, well, which one is the best? It's the same question as asking your friend, which is the best vehicle? It depends on what you're talking about, whether it's price, safety, resale value, how it handles. There is no one answer for which weather model is best all of the time. And that's why we use a group of models, just like companies use a board of directors, because any person can be right sometimes, but as a group, you generally get a better decision. And that's the whole purpose why we show you those plots of multiple computer models. Now here's one model, and what it shows is landfall, mostly east of Apalachicola, early Wednesday morning, around 7 a.m., that would be central time. And what it also shows is that storm at landfall is not going to be perfectly circular. It will be oblong, and that's the difficulty in pinpointing where that center will be, where the eye wall will be, where you get some of the most intense winds. But even though you may be focusing on that, look at this big band of rain extending across the Florida Peninsula. Tornado threat will be with that, just like these far outer bands around the storm. And the wind threat will also increase as the wind direction slowly shifts. So that's early in the morning. But just think about that forecast as you would any sport. Take archery, which is a really good example. The goal is to get the arrow right in the middle of the target. But even the best archer can't do that consistently. You constantly are off one direction or another. So you take that forecast, which is under 24 hours away, and the average forecast accuracy or error from the National Hurricane Center at 24 hours, it's, it's still 45 miles in any direction, meaning it could still be offshore, it could be farther inland, it could be more east or more west. And the wind, which I'll show you the wind projections in a moment, the wind at landfall can easily be 10 miles an hour stronger than what you'll see, or 10 miles an hour less strong than what you're going to see. Now those are just averages. And keep in mind, we are forecasting, we're predicting something that has never happened before in the history of the world, exactly as it's going to happen tomorrow. We do know, based on weather balloons, satellite reports, airplane reports, we kind of know the wind direction, what's going on around the Gulf of Mexico and also down near the ground. But what we need to know is the steering wind. And based on all of that I just mentioned, you see a very solid steering wind that's blowing from south to north in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's why it's beginning to pick up forward speed. Now that's at about three miles up, 15,000 feet. You head up to about six miles, about 30, 35,000 feet. You see that same steering wind. You don't see anything that will push it back to the west. You don't see anything that will take it to the east. So this is why computer models have been very consistent. Not all storms are as predictable as this one, but this is the challenge of trying to decipher what these winds are doing and doing that for the entire planet. And that's the only way you can make a forecast. And a lot of credit goes to researchers, computer modelers, 
folks who collect weather data, it's not just we meteorologists who forecast. There's a whole history of decades and decades of research that goes into trying to figure out where the storms are going. In the near term, the strongest winds stay offshore, the highest wind, but notice where they are pointing, the Florida Big Bend. If you didn't know it, it's called the Big Bend because the state of Florida is north and south and then it bends and goes east and west. So that is the Big Bend of Florida. And notice the hurricane warnings now extend all the way into South Georgia by multiple counties. And that's because this will be a strong storm. It will be moving fast. It will not lose strength immediately at, at landfall and that's why you see projections there all the way pretty much into southeast Georgia for hurricane force winds. Tropical storm warnings surround that and that's also a very large area which includes the east coast of Florida and south Florida. Now with those winds pushing water against the coast, the water is going to rise. Storm surge, not rainfall, but storm surge as high 10 to 15 feet. Think about 15 feet for a ranch home that is up to the roof, if not over the roof, depending upon the design of the home. So this is catastrophic potential flooding for the Florida Big Bend area from storm surge. Down toward Tampa right now projections three to five feet, which is still significant for a very densely populated area, a densely populated bay. And even all the way southward to the Keys, several feet of surge, just like along the Georgia coast and South Carolina coast. There are rip current advisories. Notice along the East Coast, those are from Franklin, that strong storm. Rip current advisories for the Northern Gulf Coast. And if you're wondering why there are none for the West Coast of Florida, it's because you have a hurricane warning and that overrides anything lesser. Safety, flash flood watch, North Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, rainfall projections remain half a foot easily, which means some locations will get more rain than that. And if all goes well for Florida, the heaviest rain may stay more out over the Gulf than central Florida, but that is still a threat. Everything is a fine line between where it could happen and where it may not happen. Feeder bands, as I mentioned, this is a projection before sunrise. You see a feeder band to the north. You see a weak band offshore on the east coast, more band south of it. And this model is not perfect, which means there could be other ones. And those are the bands that produce the isolated tornadoes. Landfall around 8 o'clock in the morning for North Florida. At that point, the west coast of Florida picks up an onshore wind. The east coast of the uh, Georgia and the Carolinas picks up an onshore wind. You get storm surge coming in from two different directions. By noon, the center of the storm goes into Georgia, still likely as a hurricane. And then by uh, sunset, by evening, it crosses the Savannah River weakening to a tropical storm, but still going through South Carolina, North Carolina before heading out into the Atlantic Ocean. It's a storm that has a long potential track of impact. I mentioned the tornado threat overnight in Florida. Tomorrow, that tornado threat shifts to Southeast Georgia, the coast of South Carolina. Now here's the forecast cone and what it shows, strengthening, continuing as this storm moves toward the north overnight. The big picture, this has not changed very much. Note the wind speed by uh, midday tomorrow, 85 miles an hour heading into South Georgia. By 1 a.m. on Thursday, 60 miles an hour. Still substantial for a system. It will curve out into the Atlantic, dissipate to just a regular region of low pressure. And by the way, way farther out, there is tropical depression number 11. It is east of Franklin. There's Hurricane Franklin with winds of 125 miles an hour. I'm not going to talk about tropical depression 11 because it will likely have a short life. Franklin's winds gusting to 155 miles per hour. It will bypass Bermuda, but Bermuda will get the impact. Storm surge, rain, potential tornadoes. And of course, the rip current risk, which will extend along the entire east coast of the United States. When we talk about hurricane impact, everything I showed you, that's the science, but the impact is what you feel. Will it be wind? Will it be storm surge? Will it be rain? Will it be a tornado threat? Well, all of those depend on the size of the storm, the strength of the storm, how fast it's moving. And for all of those, you have basically three categories. It could be small, medium, large. It could be slow, medium, fast. It could be weak, moderate, or strong. And that right there, that is, a combination of nine possible variables to figure out any one of those four 
So you're talking 36 combinations of how a storm could impact you, which does not include how your home is built, what the drainage is in your community. All of that plays into your impact. In the NBC 15 area, this is my coverage area. We've got rain, we've got thunderstorms. We need that. We will not have a direct impact from Edalia. We will have an indirect impact, and that will be during the day on Wednesday, a northerly wind, and that north wind will actually push some water up against the north sides of Dauphin Island, the Fort Morgan Peninsula, uh, Destin, for example. It may lower the water levels in many of our bays. It won't be a strong wind, but it will be a moderate wind, and that will be our impact. And for Florida and the entire Gulf Coast, rip currents, don't forget tides. We are in a perigee moon, approaching a full moon. That means the high tide will naturally be higher. There's our threat in the NBC 15 area. I'm NBC 15 Chief Meteorologist Alan Seals.